Hello and welcome back to the second of our two opening up night plenaries. The first panel um, conceptually examined the relationship between economic inequality and human rights. And in this panel, we'll be picking up on many of the same themes and questions. However, our focus will be on global inequality, both between countries and between citizens of the world. It's clear that the world we live in is an extremely unequal place, and moreover, that a key determinant of differential global economic opportunities is one citizenship or country origin, precisely because of the mean incomes of countries are so different. This panel asks whether and how human rights discourse, doctrines and practices can contest this growing global inequality. This question also lends itself to a prior investigation as to the causes of extreme and growing global inequalities and interrogating the role of international law in producing, stabilising and contesting these global inequalities. We're therefore delighted to have a fantastic panel of speakers to address these topics. Our first speaker is Anthony Angie, who is the Samuel D. Thurman Professor of Law at the University of Utah College of Law. And these questions around global inequality are not new, so it's appropriate that he'll be speaking about a historical attempt to contest global inequality, about the new international economic order, globalisation and human rights. Halal Oliva is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Food and a Global Distinguished Fellow at the UCLA Resident Food Program. Um, she will be speaking on the national, the global and the transnational inequalities and their impact on food and promoting the, right, the human right to food. <coughs> Jason Hickel. Um, over here is a Lederham Early Career Fellow at the London School of Economics, and he'll be adding a new contemporary um, problem to this mix on global inequality, speaking about a world of ecological overshoot and the ecological constraints and what impact that has on realising human rights in an age of global inequality. And finally, Balakrishna Rajagopal is the Associate Professor of Law and Development in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he will be speaking on global inequality and global struggles and the role of social movements in contesting global inequality and asking about whether human rights are relevant in these struggles for um, inequality. And apologies to my right is William Forbath, who is co-chairing this panel with me, and he will pose questions to the panellists. All right. Without further ado, the first question is simply the title of the panel. Um, can human <coughs> rights contest global inequality? <coughs> is there a, Tony starts. Um, so I speak for five to seven minutes on this topic, and then... Uh, we'll revert to a more open discussion. Uh, so let me begin <coughs> by <coughs> thanking uh, Karen and everybody else involved in um, organizing this wonderful event uh, and for the very detailed instructions given to us, despite which the taxi driver somehow contrived to get lost. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I am, I must say, one of those people that Karen mentioned. I've been up since 4.30 in the morning, and I was afraid that I would doze off in the course of this event. But the last panel was so interesting that I find myself still alert. My own presentation is not of such great interest to me, so I hope I don't doze off in the course of that. <laughs> but at least that, that is what chairs are here for. Um, the main theme I would like to try and discuss is um, uh, what seems to me a very interesting phenomenon, and perhaps it's only because of my particular preoccupations. I feel what is interesting, it seems to me, is that problems that have been experienced in a very vivid and a powerful way in the third world seem to me to be increasingly the problems that the first world and the United States itself, for instance, appears to be facing. So uh, a few years ago, I found myself in upstate New York, and I found myself uh, looking at these abandoned buildings and um, closed factories and so forth, and I thought to myself, well, this is sort of like structural adjustment, except that it's here in the United States itself. And I felt the same way, of course, uh, in relation to the various uh, terrorist attacks that have been taking place in the West. I come from Sri Lanka, and this is something that is almost normal there, at least until relatively recently. And so then it comes as a shock when these things happen, as in the re most recent case, the horror 
the horror of the Brussels uh, tragedy uh, uh, as another example of what seems to be sort of third world problems becoming problems faced in the West itself in a very vivid way. Um, so uh, here I'd just like to say that uh, the whole problem of inequality was something that was very powerfully felt by third world countries after they acquired independence because they felt that, you know, we're poor because you are rich. And so there's a very clear idea of causation and structure that was in place here. It wasn't as though inequality was in any way a natural phenomenon. It was a cause of a particular set of structures and a particular set of practices that could be easily identified. And so for the international lawyers of the 1970s, uh, those structures had to do with the international legal regime relating to trade and the international legal regime relating to foreign investment. And developing countries saw this as the source of inequality and tried very hard to transform each of these regimes. So we take for granted the existence of this very powerful entity, the World Trade Organization. But at least in the 1960s and 70s, the third world countries presented a very powerful alternative, which at one time, incredibly enough, appeared to be a real alternative, a real rival to what was to become the WTO. And that was UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development. So that was in the field of trade. In the field of foreign investment, uh, there was enormous contestation that took place about the whole issue of the structures of foreign investment and compensation to be paid um, upon nationalization, um, which is, was a very important feature of the political practices of developing countries because they needed to retake control of the resources that they hoped would then be used for the benefit of their own people rather than for the corporations uh, that have previously been uh, the beneficiaries of these very, uh, you could say, generous concession agreements. So the interesting thing to note is that in this structure, human rights played very little role, if at all. Human rights was not seen as an important mechanism for the remedying of this fundamental structural global inequality. <coughs> human rights were important for the third world, but the most important human right that developing countries focused on was the right of self-determination. That itself is controversial about how self-determination counts as a human right. But the basic idea was, you know, we can't fight our cause unless we are a sovereign state, because unless we are a sovereign state, we can't engage with the international system. Now, um, the interesting thing then to note was that the whole third world project, uh, which was which was presented in the, under, under the rubric of the new international economic order, was, I would say, largely defeated for various complex reasons that we can't address right now. And it was after that that human rights became a vehicle for the whole problem of inequality. And this took place in the form of the, right to, to, uh, the Declaration on the Right to Development, which some of our previous panelists have already mentioned. Now, that tried to use human rights as a way of bringing about some kind of global redistribution. But even from a legal point of view, if you <coughs> analyze closely the language of that right to development, I would say that those rights were phrased in a very soft sort of way and were hardly enforceable in, in any significant form. Now, the final point I want to make, because I'm conscious I'm running out of time, is, uh, goes back to an issue that Karen raised. And Karen said, isn't it interesting that neoliberalism seemed to flourish and expand at the same time as the expansion of human rights? Um, so what are we to make of that correspondence? And I would say, if we had to pick a date for this particular phenomenon, we would say the fall of the Berlin Wall and everything that followed from there. Uh, what I would like to suggest here is that uh, you know, human rights is a very convenient way, in fact, of preventing global redistribution. Because if we adopt a particular vision of human rights, the basic argument is that you, the state of Nigeria, have a responsibility to your people. And if you're a poor country, then the reasons for that have to do with your own structures. It doesn't have anything to do with global international structures such as the laws relating to trade or investment. Now, of course, it is absolutely true <laughs> that many developing countries have corrupt um, governments which are uh, completely irresponsible in dealing with this whole question of inequality. But at the same time, I would say there are global factors that are involved here. So in this context, human rights can be used in a very conservative way because it basically suggests if you're poor, it's your fault and it's the fault of your state. We don't need to change the structures of foreign investment law. We don't need to change the structures of international trade law. The further point we might make is the way in which neoliberalism itself adopted the language of human rights. 
So this is the point that Upendra Bakshi makes wonderfully in his article when he talks about the marketization of human rights. So we have institutions such as the World Bank and uh, so forth saying we're actually promoting human rights. And so there's a massive expansion and adoption and perhaps appropriation of the language of human rights. And I think that's something we need to take into account when discussing this whole question of human rights. Just to fi close finally, so isn't it interesting now, after we see the massive expansion of the trade regime, the extraordinary expansion of the foreign investment regime. Um, this is something that was completely unprecedented, even as up to 1990. Now we have these international arbitral uh, tribunals uh, handing down decisions uh, you know, worth $50 billion. So that was the decision handed down recently. Um, and isn't it interesting that it is now in the United States that so much of the debate surrounding the current election cycle focuses on trade regimes and foreign investment regimes, and it focuses, for example, more specifically, concretely on something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. So this seems to me to kind of continue this pattern of Finally, the first world, because of the problems being confronted here as a result of the fact that the external exploitation has already taken place, now it's a question of the internal exploitation and appropriation. Finally, it is beginning to realize the consequences of the regimes which it created itself. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, uh, we heard very interesting and, uh, comments and questions, and we pretty much, I think, covered the uh, kind of conceptual understanding of uh, human rights inequality, and also at the same time, of course, we have a lot of questions in our mind. How do we think about it in an abstract way? Can we really put it as more concrete uh, examples. That's why I'm trying to make it more concrete examples uh, looking at the uh, uh, right to food. It's, it's one of the economic and social rights, Article 11, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, since 1966 uh, the covenant was uh, in, uh, there and in around uh, late 70s ratified and 130 countries also ratified the convention. But despite all these things, when you talk about the United States, when you talk about the right to food, generally the audience are very skeptical. They are asking, and what, what you are talking about, right to food? This is something that we have to deal with the politics. We have to do with uh, food security. So what I'm trying to say, why we have to talk about the right to food with the concept of human rights and why this concept of human rights is connected with the inequality. Actually, many of the economic and social rights are economic, social, and cultural rights are very much connected with inequality. For me, the food is almost, uh, 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 if we don't talk inequality, we really cannot handle the policies of the uh, right to food. That's, that's uh, intrinsically important because there are, as uh, the earlier uh, panels, Radhika mentioned about the two sides of the inequality, horizontal and vertical. In, in right to food issue, we always talk about the horizontal and uh, uh, vertical inequalities, which are extremely uh, important because when we talk about the gender, gender equality is directly connected with the right to food because the role of women are basically undermined in relation to right to food. If we really don't make this strong equality uh, connection, we are not going to handle uh, the right to food issue because more than 60 70 percent of the farmers are women right now what we call about the uh, feminization of the uh, agriculture which is so much important and also the role of women in relation to family with the children and nutrition are extremely important plus uh, women have uh, significant difficulties to access to resources property rights and uh, fertilizers and <laughs> services credits and seeds and you name it. So when we talk about uh, right to food, when we write our uh, uh, reports, we first start what kind of people we really have to protect first. And that's 
is that gives us a kind of conceptual understanding issue. The one is the gender, role of the women. The second is the smallholder farmers. We keep talking about the smallholder farmers, but why important the smallholder farmers are? If we look at the global economic order, which you perfectly uh, sort of uh, paved the way in my uh, presentation a little bit about the role of the global economic order and how to protect uh, uh, small holders and who gives us a foot. This is the question. Who prepares the food? Who produces the food? As of today, still, 70% of the food comes from the smallholder farmers. And the smallholder farmers, uh, unfortunately, only 40-50% of the lands uh, they own, and their role in the global <coughs> economic order is getting diminishing and diminishing and very strongly almost disappearing because of the new way of the way in which we are handling our agriculture policies and the trade policies. So how do we protect, uh, protect smallholder farmers that give us a food 70% of? How do we protect also indigenous people? Indigenous people basically are living in a remote places and their, their resources are in extreme danger Again, again, because of the extractive industries and because of the land grabbing and many other things. So if you look at the human rights concept that inequality and the right to food definitely almost impossible to differentiate each other in our specific Article 11 of the right to food. But how successful we are, then the problem is coming. Because what we have to deal with, we have to deal with the global economic order, international trade rules, WTO, World Bank, IMF, these international organizations, the way in which they are making their decisions are completely against to deal with these vulnerables that I really was talking about. So the inequality is absolutely important because these groups that we really have to deal with, which basically are basic uh, life uh, depending on that, uh, are diminished by the international organizations plus the corporate interests. So we have two important enemies to deal with the uh, right to food. International organizations, World Bank, IMF, WTO, new TTP, I'm not going to go to what NAFTA did to Mexicans that they are serious problem right now domestically, and this will be also uh, applicable many of the African countries and the developing countries. So uh, uh, I would suggest you, you read this, uh, one of the recent reports of the, uh, Philip Alston, and he started his uh, report, World Bank is human rights free institution. So you have to understand there's a serious problem in our international organizations. Corporate interest is much more serious because the monopolization of the corporations, like the, we were talking about first 60 people own the 50% of the uh, whole uh, global uh, uh, wealth. Many of these people, 60 people, are basically either or, uh, are doing pharmaceutical or um, health and agricultural business. And when we look at the agro-businesses, we are not talking about more than 10 corporations. These are, we all know the names, and they are not only dealing with one particular part of the uh, agricultural value chain, but now monopolizing all the whole chain. They are, they are in charge of the production, which is they use contract farmers, the poor farmers, and but they also deal with the seeds, fertilizer, marketing, and the supermarket. So we all eat produce right now owned by 10 corporations. This is a significant unequal <coughs> position that we cannot really further go. Let me stop right now. I think I finished my time. Thank you. Thank you. Listen.
So um, when, uh, <clears throat> when Julia first asked me to present the paper here, um, initially I was going to offer an argument uh, pretty similar to what Anthony's was, um, which uh, for most of my career I very firmly believed. Um, but I challenged myself to, to at least attempt for fun an affirmative answer to the question. So, um, so I wrote a paper. And of course, I can't give the paper now. But what I will do is, is kind of walk you through some of the steps of my argument. Um, so the first step um, in my paper is to, uh, is to try to define the extent to which the most minimal socioeconomic rights of the world's poor remain unfulfilled. So when it comes to the question of poverty, as you know, the, the dominant narrative out there tells us that things are rapidly getting better. Right? So for example, the MDGs uh, claim to have cut extreme poverty rates in half to the point where uh, there are now fewer than 1 billion people living on less than $1.25 a day. But I argue that this good news narrative um, isn't exactly accurate. It's very misleading. There are a number of problems with the data, uh, but the main issue is that the $1.25 per day um, uh, line is far too low for even basic human survival. Okay? Um, we know that in India, for example, a child living just above this line has, um, has a 60% chance of being uh, underweight. In Niger, another example, uh, babies born just above this line face an infant mortality risk of something like 20%, which is three times the world average. So if $1.25 is not enough to guarantee basic nutrition or infant survival, then we cannot claim that lifting people above this line means bringing them out of poverty. That's my contention. So uh, uh, economist Peter Edward um, has, has shown that in order to achieve uh, normal human life expectancy of about 70 years, people need 3.9 times more than the standard international poverty line. So that's about $5 per day in 2005 PPP. So this is what Edward calls the ethical poverty line. And it has support from a number of, uh, of other studies showing that $5 a day is, uh, is the very minimum that people need in order to achieve the most basic nutrition and at least somewhat reasonable infant mortality rates, but still not very good. So what happens if we measure poverty according to the ethical poverty line? We see that the global poverty headcount uh, is not 1 billion people, as the UN would have, would, would have us believe, but rather closer to about 4.3 billion people. Uh, so that's 60% of the world's population, and the number has been, uh, importantly, rising since 1980 uh, and not falling. And keep in mind that the ethical poverty line um, uh, is highly conservative, okay? So it's not adequate to achieve the full spectrum of basic rights um, to food, water, shelter, et cetera, et cetera, um, as laid down in international texts such as uh, Article 25. So it's clear... Um, uh, I contend that the socioeconomic rights of at least 60% of humanity are not, are, are, um, uh, remain avoidably unfulfilled. So when I, I draw on Thomas Pogge's work, um, his, insti his institutional view of human rights, to argue that the responsibility for, for fulfilling these unfulfilled rights falls not solely on national governments, um, but on the citizens and governments of the rich world, uh, because the most significant drivers of poverty um, uh, are not national uh, or endogenous, but rather have to do with the structure of the global economy, which produces, as we know, you know, immense wealth, and yet funnels that wealth almost exclusively uh, to a small minority of the human population. So in my paper, I, I try to outline this argument historically, uh, beginning with the legacy of European imperialism and the impact of unequal trade uh, treaties imposed by colonial powers, then also looking at the immediate post-colonial period during which um, uh, Western powers used coups to depose global South leaders who rolled out pro-poor development policies that adversely affected Western economic interests. I also cover the impacts of structural investment programs, uh, you know, which caused long-term stagnation of per capita income and added some 1.2 billion people to the ranks of the world's poor. And I also look at more contemporary issues, looking at the, like the severe devaluation of global South labor uh, due to the liberalization of capital flows, substantial loss of global South export uh, earnings due to the Uruguay rounds, the impact of the food price crisis caused by reckless financial speculation, loss of human life due to uh, the TRIPS agreement, um, uh, and its restrictions on patents. On patents. Um, and I also look at illicit financial flows, a big issue right now, uh, which drain developing countries of around $2 trillion per year. And then finally, the costs of climate change uh, caused by historical emissions from the industrialized world. So I argue that the governments of the world's rich countries which created and sustained this, this imbalanced economic order are actively violating the rights of the world's poor, the human rights of the poor. And, have a, and, and they have a corresponding responsibility to seek to reorganize the economic order such that uh, as many people as possible have secure access to the resources necessary to, uh, to achieve basic uh, health and well-being. So in monetary terms, it would cost 3.1 trillion US dollars annually to bring the, those 4.3 billion people up to the $5 a day line. Okay? So that means shifting 4.4% of, uh, of, of aggregate global income, or about 15% of OECD income, down to the poorest 60% of humanity. 
So, and of course, this requires some major reorganization of the global economic system, and I offer some, uh, some, some, uh, some ideas for, how that, for what that might look like. Um, so, in this sense, realizing human rights does appear to require uh, a reduction in global inequality, but only to a certain extent. So it would appear that once the basic rights of the poor are satisfied, there's no reason that the rich cannot accumulate more uh, and therefore widen the inequality gap, right? So and this is basically the approach taken by the UN's SDGs. Uh, as you probably know, they, they call for eradicating poverty by ratcheting up the poor, uh, but without placing any limits on income growth or resource use by the rich, okay? So I argue that this notion rests on the very flawed assumption that we can increase aggregate global consumption indefinitely. Right now, our planet only has sufficient biocapacity for each of us to consume 1.7 global hectares annually, which is a standardized unit that measures resource use and the ability of our planet to absorb our waste. But people in the rich world consume an average of six global hectares per person, which is more than three times their fair share. And as a result of overconsumption in these rich regions, we are overshooting our planet's total biocapacity bio by about 50% each year. Um, so and, and as we know from recent uh, planetary boundaries research, we're kind of blowing past planetary boundaries at breakneck speed, you know, the sixth great mass extinction, et cetera, et cetera, to say nothing in climate change. So what this means is that aggregate income growth is actually no longer an option. If we want to ratchet up the incomes of the poor in order to satisfy their human rights, uh, and if we want to do so without further violating their human rights with poverty-inducing climate change and resource depletion, uh, then we will have to ratchet down the rich. Confronting inequality is the only way to end poverty in a climate and resource-constrained world. So the challenge of the 21st century, I would contend, is to figure out how to maximize human development while bringing our ecological footprint back within sustainable levels. So this is not an impossible task, uh, and I give examples of countries that have accomplished it. Um, so... Uh, so my conclusion um, is, is that in the absence of, of some kind of a miraculous deco decoupling of incomes from resource use and waste, which I argue shows no signs of happening in any meaningful way, the human rights framework requires not only slight reductions in global inequality, but actually the dramatic material shrinkage of the incomes of the richest countries. So in other words, uh, this would amount to a total reorganization of the existing uh, global political economy. Uh, that's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure we'll have the answers by the end of the conference how to do that. Um, thank you, Karen, for inviting me again twice in the same academic year down here. It's a real pleasure to meet all of your wonderful colleagues and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, your students and so on. And um, uh, I don't know if, uh, I mean, I just arrived, and I don't know what the conversations were in the previous two panels, whether... It's useful to uh, raise uh, some preliminary issues, uh, which may be more conceptual in a way, but um, if, if they've been dealt with already, then I'll quickly get a nod, move on, and then I can move on to the maybe the more movement, social movement, empirical part of what I wanted to say. Uh, I, because I think the question of whether human rights can contest global inequality has to be uh, unpacked a little bit. Uh, there are two words that, that I think we should unpack very carefully. One is the word global, and the other is the word inequality. Uh, the word global, I think, um, is, is useful, has been historically useful, as, uh, as uh, Tony Angi pointed out, for certainly for developing countries to think about inequality in intra international terms between countries. Uh, they've certainly motivated, the developing countries are motivated by inequality and they certainly hitched onto this rationale of catching up in order to you know bring themselves up to the same level and in my development class I point out this this catching up rationale as we all want to be Denmark rationale you know, which still pervades the development field of course uh, but I, I wonder whether we should actually stop and you know ask whether global is in fact thinking about global in this way is still a very useful way of thinking about inequality uh, partly because some of the issues raised, um, um, but also because um, uh, whether, uh, you know, in a world where, uh, leave aside the question of poverty, but in terms of inequality, you know, it allows people who defend the world economic order to argue that, in fact, countries have been able to level up. Uh, inequality, economic inequality between countries has reduced, if you judge in terms of inequality between countries. Uh, but it's when you look at the inequality within countries uh, that very different picture emerges. Uh, 
and also in terms of inequality, in terms of the percentage of populations that benefit within countries. It's not just at the level of household analysis, but at the level of percentages. So, for example, you know, we know that, uh, you know, inequality that, that um, you know, results from the sort of inequality that you see when, say, the top 20 percent of the population uh, grabs most of the, you know, um, has most of the wealth concentrated in it, actually may have a negative impact on human rights, but also increasingly on traditional economic indicators like growth. So what this does is that it allows the conversation about global inequality to be framed within conventional parameters. Uh, in other words, you know, organizations like the IMF can kind of reorient themselves as they have been doing as organizations who actually deeply worry about inequality. Uh, and there I can tell you a number of studies where inequality has emerged as a major hard theme in IMF studies. What do we make of stuff like that? Okay, so I want to sort of problematize what do we mean by global, really? And I want to make a pitch that with all its awkwardness, we've got to think of some other way of scalar way of talking about it. Glocal. I know that we all hate that word, but um, <laughs> it's been around for two decades at least. And there isn't a better way of understanding how inequality operates in a way that goes outside of the Westphalian framework that somehow captures what really is going on, from, at least from the perspective of those who are most affected by it, the sort of people that Hilal Elwer is talking about, you know, the small farmers, the women, the indigenous people. It's very hard to think about those people in terms of just global inequality if we mean only international inequality. The second issue is about... The second conceptual issue is about inequality versus inequalities. I would say pluralize it. And there are two, certainly two kinds of inequalities that, uh, you know, uh, at least the literature uh, con has contended with. One are inequalities of outcome, which are basically inequalities around income and wealth and expenditure. And most of the studies around inequality have been, as you know, like the focus on Gini coefficient and so on, have been really about inequalities of income. Uh, wealth less so and others uh, even less. But contrasted to inequalities of outcome, you have the inequalities of opportunities, which are essentially inequalities created by your situation because of your gender or ethnicity or indigenous status or, or location of birth or family background or whatever it is, the accidents that make you unequal. You know? uh, and I do want to make a pitch that human rights can actually be useful in tackling inequalities of opportunities. But it's highly unlikely, in fact, it could be the reverse, as uh, others have pointed out, that it could be part of the problem when it comes to addressing inequalities of outcome. So inequalities of opportunities, maybe human rights could be useful, and I do see it in the practice of many movements and others who actually use human rights. But when they take on the issues of inequalities of outcome, they either find it impossible because human rights framework doesn't allow for such an articulation, or if the way in which they do it gets frequently absorbed or uh, co-opted by, uh, let's say, market-friendly versions of human rights by not just the World Bank, but corporations and many others who can reframe their, their engagement with the poor as rights-friendly. And I, I think that uh, we need to be conscious of this. And I, one thing I, I will close, I know my time is almost up, is that we can theorize about this academically, but in the practice of movements, actually they're acutely conscious of this. So there's one reason why some of the most interesting movements in the world are neither entirely located in the human rights vernacular or human rights worldview, as you call it, or the expertise of professional talk, you know, with all the articles and conventions, all the rest of it that we like in the law schools. Um, but uh, they do, however, position themselves you know, in an, almost in an opportunistic way with human rights, taking advantage of it as they like, and other times, you know, staying away from it. I mean, I'm just thinking of a movement like Via Campesina, for example, which has not articulated its position in terms of a right to food, in fact, but is articulated in terms of food sovereignty. Uh, and why is that? Right? We have to ask, is it that they hate human rights? Well, on the contrary. In fact, they've been working closely with FIAN and... Uh, the uh, you know uh, FAO and other international organizations, not to mention the UN Human Rights System, to push for new international law instruments, such as the new draft declaration on the rights of peasants, uh, 
which is now currently pending before the UN, you know, human rights system. There is an intergovernmental body that has just gone through its third revision of that. Now, why would they play the game both ways? I and mean, we need to really ask this question. I mean, I can give other examples, but I, I do think that we have to appreciate the fact that uh, the question of whether human rights can tackle inequality, global inequality has to be sort of approached in terms of, you know, what do we exactly mean by global and what are these sorts of inequalities? And what I want to say is that human rights by itself may not be able to respond to or may or may not be able to respond to a single inequality at a time, an inequality of income alone, inequality of gender status or whatever. But it's the interlocking nature of these inequalities in today's world, when you're not just poor, but you're also low caste. And the caste is a very much a part of an explanation of why you're poor. Uh, the location advantages that come from being an urban or rural are totally associated with your identity. You know, if you're a lower caste person, you just find it harder you know, to move, for example, to other locations where you can, say, get more value for your labor. Uh, the way in which we, part of the global class here, find it so easy to move to any city in the world, you know, and find that, you know, we're always in demand. You know, people will pay us to do what we do best, which is to sit and talk. So, um, so I do, I do want to just say that uh, we need to, uh, we need to really think very hard about what exactly are we going at here? What's really on the agenda? What a good question. So here's a, a question about the agenda um, that seems to me to tie together um, your several wonderful reflections. Is it time to step back in the, in the way that Raj has just evoked um, from an all-encompassing human rights vocabulary and project if inequality is to be put on the agenda? Is, is, is it time for a new, new international economic order? What was something essential lost, at least in the space in which inequality is the target evil, when um, the combatants um, for the uh, disadvantaged embraced human rights and, <coughs> and sort of left behind the kind of institutional imagination that, that Tony evoked and that it sounds to me several of you are saying um, is essential. So a new, new economic order, is, is that too utopian, too a project of something other than international rights mavens to even be talking about again? Who is, you're asking to who? I, I think, so shall, we, shall we go take a leaf from Karen's book and go in the opposite? We'll, sure. we'll, 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 we'll go start with Raj, sure. then Jason, Lal, and then Tony. I, I think you have you, I, you put it very nicely. In fact, I do think that we not only should, I mean, we not only should think about a new, new international order, as you put it, as something that results from, you know, any serious attempt to take inequality uh, as a central project of today's world and, and, and of our, our collective efforts. Um, we, we do have to actually, I think, take uh, this project very seriously. And, and there, um, what, um, uh, what Jason said about uh, particularly the ratcheting down the rich is something that I think ties in very well with uh, um, uh, some of the initial ways in which uh, the new, new uh, economic order might have to be brought about. Um, and there is this whole degrowth movement in certainly coming out of Europe, but also picked up very much uh, by uh, um, at least those who are more on the, shall we say, the left side of the spectrum in the, in the U.S., you know, people working with, uh, you know, urban poor, people working with uh, those who are homeless and others who have been pushing for this idea that the 2008 crisis was really you know, something that taught us this lesson that we need to ratchet things down, really. And they are actually um, taking inspiration from the works of people like David Harvey, who are actually pushing for this idea that, in fact, rich countries need to shrink. And ecological factors aside, for the very sustainability of the social and political order that's supposed to rest on capitalism, which is obvious 
it's not able to, we need to ratchet things down. That is one. The other is actually in the practice of movements, are they also, you know, are they, are they strategies simply coping and adapting and resisting strategies, or are they also developing alternatives? And I want to say that, in fact, in the practice of many movements, you do see the sort of the germination of not the new economic order in a macro sense, but a thousand instances of little experiments that happen across different borders. You know, community land trusts being, being created when law doesn't allow for it. But then you just go ahead and do it anyway. And then people creating alternative currencies, like this group in Brazil, for example, that is that created 25 years ago. This is a community of displaced people that found themselves entirely outside of the, the economic system. And while these are not, you know, what you might call a scalable models that will change everything, and I don't know if that ever is, but they certainly offer inspiration for the sort of new, new international, uh, the new, new economic order that you're talking about. Um, so, yes, the answer is yes, surely. Uh, thanks. Yeah. So, so yeah. You know, my my arguments um, uh, has clearly been that, that a new new international order um, is not just a nice thing that we could think about, but actually an, an absolute necessity if we want to uh, to fulfill the, the human rights of the poor um, and eradicate poverty, etc. Um, so, so the way this has been thought about before uh, has been in terms of kind of. Um, like rebalancing uh, political economy, like the power relationships, uh, relationships in the global economy. So, you know, you know the, the fixes that we might advance would be things like putting an end to tax evasion uh, and structural adjustment, you know, canceling odious debts to give more, um, more uh, like policy latitude to developing countries to, uh, to regulate their economies and use subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, democratizing the World Bank and the IMF and the WTO, absolutely essential. These are totally anti-democratic institutions. I don't know how that's survived in the 21st century. Uh, you know, um, de decommodifying life-saving medicines and essential technologies, and of course, renegotiating free trade agreements under transparent and democratic uh, conditions for the first time would be nice. But, um, but so, so it seems to me that none of these fixes are actually enough anymore uh, in a world where we have, you know, uh, um, ecological overshoot. So it seems to me that 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 core to our demands for a sort of new, new international economic order would have to be abolishing GDP growth as the basic imperative of the global economy. Um, and I didn't really believe this until about a year ago, because I've long believed that GDP growth is really essential for making sure that you produce sufficient incomes for poverty eradication, et cetera. But, uh, but I've been really convinced by the, by the very rapidly growing, ironically, degrowth movement, which is probably, it's, at least in Europe, it's got to be the fastest growing economic idea Ever. I mean, it's grown from a, a few dozen scholars uh, at, at their annual conference a couple of years ago to now th thousands. I mean, 3,000, 4,000 people attend this annual conference. So to me, this is a very exciting idea, and, uh, and uh, it is creating lots of fascinating debate. Well, uh, I think I'm going to put a little bit more spe specificity in relation to uh, food, because we need a new, new economic order. We need also a new agricultural system. You know, the production system is basically based, uh, the agriculture is based on production. If you look at the production <coughs> system, and we, we try to produce more and more, we are not going uh, to feed the people. We will all just disappear together because of the economic uh, limits, of ecological limits of the world. So what we should do, we have to change several things. Instead of going into big agribusinesses that based on more chemical pesticides and big agriculture and monoculture and a seed type of monopolization, we have to really support the, what uh, Raj is saying, uh, basically sovereignty, food sovereignty-based agroecology movement. And this is in the table, uh, last uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, uh, many agricultural ecologists were uh, dealing with this, but unfortunately the general system does not really make this alternative as an uh, electable alternative and when we talk about uh, uh, democratic uh, parties, uh, uh, candidates. 
when we say, no, he's not electable, but she's electable. This is a kind of things agroecology never been in the kind of alternative uh, for the uh, big agrobusinesses, but it is an alternative. And they, they have many countries that are dealing this. For instance, I'm very worried about right now Cuba, because Cuba was a country that they were dealing with agroecology and many other Latin American countries. Now the relationship between the United States is becoming too cozy. I'm really worried about that agroecology will be completely abandoned by the uh, end uh, entrance of the big agrobusinesses. So new, new economic order needs new agroecology, a new kind of management of the food system. Of course, this will make an, a very serious changes in relation to trade and the trade relationship. In order to do that, I think from below and from above, two uh, movements should be together, major countries, uh, from above maybe, uh, changing the international organizations here and there, uh, pushing by the uh, actually uh, citizens' movement around the world. Um, well, it's a, a very interesting thought experiment, but uh, I, I, I certainly feel that we do need a new, uh, new international economic order. Interesting question, of course, is uh, what is the role of human rights in bringing this order about? And uh, what sort of rights would this uh, new, uh, new international economic order embody in some way? Um, and we find this in a situation where there are so many dramatic changes taking place, even in the whole concept of rights. I believe, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure about this, but uh, some sort of uh, claim was made against the government of Greece on behalf, because of the austerity measures. And the government of Greece said, well, you can't hold us responsible because we are simply doing what all these different uh, financial institutions are telling us. Mm. So that's pretty dramatic. Uh, I mean, we, we know that these institutions take these measures, but it's pretty dramatic when this becomes a sort of public claim presented as a defense against some kind of um, illegal case. And so then we have to start thinking about uh, precisely the issues that I think, uh, you know, and several of you mentioned, you know, uh, how these other institutions, how these other powerful actors can be made held accountable uh, in terms of issues of basic human rights. I would say there's been a massive ongoing attempt, and we, there's a huge literature on you know, the WTO and human rights, or foreign investment and human rights, uh, and if any of you are thinking of you know, applying for a grant, I would suggest this as a topic, except that it's been written about exhaustively. I'm not quite sure what actual changes have taken place as a result, because these uh, different institutions are extraordinarily adept at just appropriating the language and saying, actually, we, the World Bank, are ensuring the right to develop matter, and uh, presenting a, a completely different paradigm in that way. Um, so I think, uh, let me th uh, think about some of the obstacles in fairly explicit terms. Um, what, you know, what we've seen is uh, the growth of um, the trade regimes, and even if not the growth of the, the WTO, the growth of regional trade regimes. Um, and we see the TPP as an example of that. And of course, there are a number of other such trade regimes in the world. Uh, we see the massive expansion and importance of uh, international foreign investment law. So we have to think about human rights in the context of that ongoing political context. <coughs> One possibility is that these regimes have been so successful that they are now going to be the victims of their own success. Uh, the, outcomes of these regimes being expanded is becoming more visible. But then the question is, what follows? What is the politics that follows that might bring about transformation? And this goes back to an issue that uh, Richard Falk raised. You know, um, so, for, for example, one could have thought after the global financial crisis that there would be a really radical rethinking of our whole you know, fundamental economic structure. And even though there was some fundamental rethinking, I feel on the whole, it was simply a case of patching things up again. And going back to this fundamental question of debt, which uh, was addressed as well. So, you know, the world, world is awash in debt now. And I, I, I can't have a feeling that the underlying logic of the system that caused the crisis is still very much in place. The other thing is, uh, and Hillel mentions this, uh, the, and Raj mentioned this as well, the issue of, about scale. You know, um, how can these alternative experiments um, expand, uh, uh, how would they, because it seems to me that expansion is necessary, unfortunately, because in a globalized world, they can't exist in sort of, you know, 
a splendid isolation. They have to take on the larger forces. They must inevitably encounter in some form. And so it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, you know, in the current elections, um, it's presented as a, a sort of battle between workers in the United States and workers in Mexico, rather than suggesting there could be solidarity. And that solidarity would suggest a different political and legal framework that is needed globally. <coughs> but isn't it interesting that even while this, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the victims um, experience and understand now perhaps better these structures, that they, they don't think as a collectivity in <coughs> dealing with these issues. Another problem I see is the reverse of what I mentioned earlier, which is I talked about you know, the first world now encountering problems that had previously been uh, experienced most intensely by the third world. I think there's also a reverse process whereby certain powerful forces in the third world find this current structure very much in its own interest. <laughs> so we find you know, China rapidly entering into bilateral investment treaties. You know, they are going to be a very powerful actors. They want these regimes to protect, for example, their sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and you know, some break that, that we're going to have a session on that. So I think there's that complication as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the whole idea of growth is, of course, a very powerful idea. I, you know, it seems to me that, that the legitimacy of many of the go governments in East Asia and so forth are dependent on growth rates. Can you hit that 7%, which is what provides legitimacy for your <coughs> rule uh, in various ways? Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, to go back to what Raj mentioned, you know, complicating this issue of the global and local, and as one of my uh, colleagues, B.S. Jimney would put it, it's no longer you know, rich countries and poor countries, it's rich people and poor people that should be the framework of analysis and what sort of politics emerges out of that. Sorry, I keep going on. But other, my other fear about these uh, experiments, uh, these local experiments, is the example of you know, what happened with the Grameen Bank and that sort of microfinance and lending. I mean, the main reason why so many people are in debt in many developing countries is because of all these microfinance institutions which are presenting themselves as, you know, offering the opportunity for entrepreneurship and they've got, you know, inspiring stories of how this particular woman, you know, <laughs> worked her way out of poverty and all the rest of it. Um, what they don't cover is, you know, all these competing microfinance institutions uh, causing massive indebtedness, <laughs> leading to enormous social disruption and, you know, suicides and all the rest of it. Yes. So I think I want to pose a question that Tony raised to the rest of the panel about if we are talking about a new, new international economic order, what rights would this contain? Because when we started speaking about this question, I noticed that the discussion sort of, the language of rights became much more absent in the discussion, so trying to bring that question of what rights would be part of such a new, new international economic order. And then picking up on some of the comments that Halal mentioned about strategy. What is the role of rights? Um, as part of a strategy towards pushing towards this, both and the question about what sort of synergies might there need to be between top, top down and bottom up approaches to this. And then finally, I guess, it's a rather large question, picking up on the um, other question that Tony raised around solidarities. What forms of solidarities between the global, the national and the local might need to be built in order to push for some of these changes that we seem to be in agreement on this panel that urgently need to come about. Understand? <laughs> Raj? Okay. Um, I, I, I think that uh, if you look at the draft declaration on the rights of persons, one of the discussion points that have emerged is, well, what's new about it? Why have another draft declaration? We have, the world is awash in draft declaration. Declaration. I mean, there is so much, too much law, you know, in the field of international law and human rights law. What we don't have enough of, of course, is the politics that actually can generate something concrete out of these legal instruments. And in some of the member states, when participating in discussions, have raised this question. Well, it seems like the draft is reiterating many of the rights which already exist. There is no new right as such that it is putting on the table. So the real question was, what's the use of a draft declaration as something like this? And I would say that I think that's, I think, one area where we need to sort of think about human rights in its multiple functions. The legal function is only one of them. It has a legitimating function. It has a political function. It has a, of course, a power-loaded, uh, you know, hegemonic function, and it has all these sorts of functions, and it's very hard to know when particular functions are cleanly separated from each other, and I would say 
in terms of what rights are relevant, I don't think it's, it's useful to sort of think in terms of what new rights can we cook up. You know, I, I don't think that there is – all the rights that we need for bringing about a new international order already exist, in fact. Uh, there is no new right that we need. In fact, what we need are new practices <coughs> and maybe new solidarities. You know, those are different issues, right? So I think we should move away for sure from this idea that there is somehow a, a need for a new <coughs> rights agenda, which means more legal drafting and coming up with new, new uh, you know, conventions. Like the business and human rights debate is a good example of what's really going on in the business and human rights field. That is John Reggie's framework, although many, it, it, you know, many people think that it's, it was weak, uh, I do agree with him, actually, on the position that he has taken, that there is no use really to push for a treaty. Of course, he has principal objections about why going from a you know, set of principles to a treaty is itself bad. And I think he overstates, for example, the, the damage that a treaty might do. In fact, treaty might be as toothless as a declaration anyway. So, but on the other hand, uh, the, the examples that come out of many of these so-called new areas – you know, like business and human rights. So one of those areas where if you write a proposal, you're sure to get funding. Um, <laughs> it, it's just, it's incredible how, how, how you know, uh, the approach still seems to be what new rights. And I think we need to sort of resist that, that, that temptation. And the other is about solidarities. And I think the, that's actually the really useful conversation to have. What sort of solidarities are feasible? and possible, what sort of solidarities are not. Now, the solidarity that drove the earlier Third World Agenda was born from a kind of an anti-colonial nationalism. It was a nationalistic ideology, right? The Bandung moment of 1955, developing countries came together, they saw themselves collectively as the victims of a racist and predatory colonial system that had been hoisted on them for 300 years or longer, and then they wanted to free, away, free, free themselves from it, and anything that international law could put on the table, including human rights, could be useful. That was, you know, you, you saw them embracing human rights in the Bandung Declaration. But you move forward to, say, the Sanya Declaration of 2011, of the BRICS, right, which are supposed to articulate their idea, BRICS understanding of new, the world order according to the choice of BRICS. There is zero mention of human rights, right? In fact, the, the, the statement actually sounds extremely like one of the most textual readings of the most conservative readings of the UN Charter principles. Non-interference, territorial integrity, no, you know, no other framework for anything else unless the states can first agree on it. It's a world of, you know, of, that has long gone past, but they want to return to it. They want to reassert state and statehood and bring back the state. And I think we have to actually also realize that, oddly enough, the same moment when we are living at a time of extraordinarily aggressive market fundamentalism and neoliberalism, we are also going through a period of tremendous state consolidation in country after country. State has emerged as a major actor, not just in economic terms, but politically there is an autocratic version of the state that is emerging, right? Challenges are actually diminishing. And I, I do think that that should tell us that, for example, a purely class-based struggle, for example, workers unite, kind of, you know, we can go back to Second International, may not exactly work in a world where state consolidation and the reinforcement of territorial boundaries has made it even more difficult for cross-border solidarities to emerge, really. So um, one response might be to, again, look at a movement like, you know, like Via Campesina. Uh, be you know, uh, opportunistic, essentially. Work in the interstices of the system and take advantage of where that might lead. And through the practices, not through a previously articulated party position, you're going to find solidarity. Right. Can I uh, follow up? Because I have one comment about uh, this new uh, draft declaration of the peasants' rights. Because there are two arguments in relation to peasants' rights. One is what you said, there's nothing new, everything is there. The uh, supporting argument of, of this, the basically countries that they are pushing, Latin American countries, I think Bolivia, Bolivia was one of them. Sure. 
They said, we did not create anything. We just collect wherever it is. That's why there is nothing new why you don't accept. But the U.S. government says, well, you are creating a new rights. We don't want a new human rights. So it's, it's the argument is very interesting from which perspective you are looking at and what you see about it. Basically, Europeans and U.S. is against this because they don't want a new rights. But actually, there is nothing new about it. Coming from here, the, you said that solidarity is very important. And also, I think we have to look at a little bit of implementation. What is happening? Too many human rights rules, constitutional principles, court decisions, new laws, but how we are implementing them. If we don't look at the implementation of the human rights in domestic level, I'm not even talking about international level because economic and social rights, the most powerful sub uh, uh, kind of international uh, court of the uh, European Human Rights uh, Convention doesn't even mention about the economic and social rights. So we can't really make the argument internationally, but we have to make the argument domestically. What kind of domestic rules we are really pushing? Is it really justiciable? If it is not justiciable, what we make these rights really thinkable? Because any rights that come to the courtroom, as you said, it creates a certain kind of forum that we are discussing. And the forum is successful, then maybe it becomes a law, which is the India major uh, example of this, how uh, activist uh, judges can create certain kind of uh, movement then become important law and we really follow the implementation. So uh, implementation is important. Maybe you would say that it is really weak in the economic and social rights, but it shouldn't be. Instead of making a new rules, I completely agree with you, we really have to push what else we have. But the problem is this. In international arena, for instance, 2015 was an important year because we did have sustainable development principles and we did have very famous Paris Agreement in relation to climate change. If you look at the, these two important documents, which basically kind of new, uh, not new, but the future international uh, domain in relation to social and economic rights, climate change, inequality, everything. You cannot find a word of human rights, any of these two documents. And in Paris Agreement, until very recent date, two weeks, the older the friendly governments and NGOs were pushed and pushed and pushed. There was an Article 2. All kind of human rights were nicely put in but the last day they took, and many of them disappeared, some of them very light version of the preamble we mm -hmm. saw. So we have to forget about the inequality. We really have to fight the human rights language for the future global international order. So because, let's segue back yeah. to, to Jason. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, i got a couple of things to say, I guess. So the first is just to, to kind of reaffirm what I think has already been said, and that's that it seems to me they don't really need any new rights. I guess this is what Roger's saying. We need uh, you know, more meaningful enforcement. So, um, so in the case of Article 25, you know, some people think of this as a manifesto right, but it's clearly not. It's completely fulfillable. Uh, it's being routinely violated and has been for, for its, the entirety of its existence. We know exactly what policies and practices and laws and actors are responsible for the, the non-fulfillment of those human rights. Uh, and yet, you know, there's, there's basically no way to prosecute. Um, so that, that remains a problem. Uh, really briefly, I just want to mention what's interesting to me about the right to development is that it came in in 1981, I think. Is that right? 86. 86. 86. So which is precisely the time during which structural adjustment was being rolled out most heavily um, early on, and, uh, and uh, which was actually effectively taking the right to development off the table by, uh, by transferring power over macroeconomic policy from the national level, from the sovereign nation to, uh, to Washington and New York. Uh, so that, that to me has always been like a really interesting sort of ironic conundrum. Um, I briefly want to address this question of, of solidarity, and I think maybe I, I want to think about it uh, um, in sort of its inverse form. N n not what are the best methods for us to sort of develop solidarities across struggles, but 
but what are the connections between the issues that we're fighting against, right? Uh, so, and I really do think, you know, to go back to the issue of GDP growth, you know, you know, if, if you think about, like, you know, the, the increase in land grabs, say, in India, privatization in the UK, deforestation in Brazil, fracking in the US, you know, depleted soils, polluted cities, et cetera, et cetera, like all of these, um, you know, we, we tend to think of these issues as separate, but uh, at least in part, they proceed uh, from, you know, our collective obsession with increasing GDP growth. I mean, you, you know, uh, effectively, this imperative of our global economy puts a lot of pressure on, uh, on, on, uh, on people and on resources, and we need to recognize that. So that's one really crucial connecting tissue, I think. Um, and I do, uh, I sort of want to close on this. Um, I think that, uh, that we need to think about the extent to which the ontology of human rights is maybe not actually adequate in and of itself for the, for the challenges we face. Uh, so it seems to me that we need, we need to recognize uh, that our well-being as humans is tied up with the well-being of the rivers and the forests and the oceans, uh, you know, and the bees and the fish, et cetera. I mean, this sounds like a bizarre thing for me to be saying. Uh, um, but I, I, this is kind of, you know, what I've picked up from listening to indigenous activists, and I, I really think that they're miles ahead of us when it comes to thinking along these lines. Um, and we can see it reflected in the recent rhetoric of people like Pope Francis, et cetera. And I think that like, these, these, this is actually high enlightenment, it seems to me. <laughs> so it, it, it seems to me that the key thing that connects our various struggles is not that the interests we oppose are somehow united in some kind of conspiracy, but rather that they all proceed from the same deep cultural logic, uh, which is, uh, so effectively we're, all, we're, we're collectively fighting a culture here, right? And this is kind of me as an anthropologist speaking, I guess. Uh, and it seems to me that the culture is rooted in kind of a Cartesian subject-object du uh, duality or dualism that tells us that humans are somehow separate from the rest of the world, okay, and therefore justifies, you know, the possibility of domination and exploitation which underpin our global economy. Uh, so it, it's effectively a culture that sees the earth as, as a resource to be exploited rather than as kin to be cared for. And so I wonder if, if, if maybe human rights doesn't actually quite, you know, by, 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 by privileging the human doesn't actually quite allow us to address some of that, that interconnectedness. That's kind of thought I have. Do you want to offer some reflections? Oh, um, just for, uh, well, now we're getting to the point where we are you know, looking closely at so many of the concepts we use, and now we're looking at the concept of the human itself, uh, which raises all sorts of interesting issues. Um, I would also just throw in history here. I mean, if, if we look at human rights, um, Perhaps if you look at the origins of human rights, and now, of course, there are different versions of those origins, but, you know, it has been argued that human rights are inherently conservative uh, and that uh, they're not particularly good at addressing questions of uh, economic uh, inequality. Um, and so perhaps we shouldn't expect too much of human rights, but perhaps uh, going back to some of the issues that have been discussed here, uh, one of the problems with many human rights texts is that quite often they seem to just have this whole collection of different human rights connected to everything else. Even the right to development it includes so many different issues in, in that context, and perhaps there's an argument for that because the argument is that development is an all-encompassing right. But it still leads to a sort of conceptual muddle uh, in many cases. And perhaps then we should go back to thinking about, you know, some of the basic human rights, fundamental established human rights, and enforcing those rights. So, for example, I can think of the case of migrant workers. I think it will be very useful if the fundamental civil and political rights of migrant workers are actually recognized and enforced. This isn't a question of you know, inventing new rights and thinking about some you know, radical innovative jurisprudence. It is simply saying these people have rights and you know, executing people for a particular, for a, yeah, what, you know, well, anyway, <laughs> uh, may not be uh, a fulfillment of those rights. Thank you. I think now's the time we want to open up to the floor for questions. So. Please raise your hands and there's a microphone that will be travelling around. Maybe we should take questions in groups of two to three questions. Um, so um, my question, I think, is um, for um, the uh, proposal of um, the, the $5 uh, threshold of this uh, ethical threshold. So I think I agree with some aspects of your, your critique of the MDGs and SDGs, but I, I worry that this proposal actually is just an instance of the sort of reification of stats as indicators that the, the last panel warned against. And I actually worry that it really is going to uh, fail to provide us with helpful guidance in a variety of, of situations. So um, the sort of question I have in mind is, um, you know, how do we decide whether you can get 40 million people to 250 or 20 million people to five? I'm not clear on whether this kind of ethical threshold view is going to regard 
gains beyond the below the threshold is irrelevant, or gains that can't be um, cast in economic terms is irrelevant. And so then I, what I wonder about is rather than sort of obsessing over reaching some sort of statistical benchmark, um, we would sort of do better to focus on something like progressively improving capabilities over time, progressively decreasing oppression over time, things like this that sort of sound much more modest in certain ways than um, sort of having a new economic order in which everyone will have five dollars uh, per day. But the, the sort of way that I think this links back to human rights is I wonder whether to sort of motivate the case for this alternative sort of new economic order picture, um, whether there's a reason that we would then need to get rid of this idea of progressive realization, um, whether some of the progressive realization aspects, the incrementalism that might be built into human rights, um, with which I'm actually sort of sympathetic, I think it can often be more, more guidance than this um, sort of threshold-based approach, Great. nonetheless stands in the way of the threshold approach uh, working Thank out as your uh, suggestion. Thank you. We're I think there are a lot of questions in the room, and we are limited in time, even though these discussions can continue in the reception afterwards. So can I ask that people frame the questions a little bit more tightly? But thank you for all those reflections and comments. Um, when I think about this topic, um, I think about slavery, that women and children and men are tempted to come to, say, America from poor countries because they think they have greater opportunities, um, as, and then they're saddled with the odious debt um, that they can't pay off. Um, what can those third world countries do to make opportunities more numerous in their country so that people won't be tempted to come to, say, America and be trapped? Thank you. Maybe one more now in this round. So we had three fantastic panels on indicators of measurement, on opportunities and questions of slavery, and on agency. Does anyone want to respond? I can just respond really briefly to the, to the $5 a day line question. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, it, it seems to me that that these monetary thresholds are really arbitrary. I'm, I'm not at all satisfied with $5 a day. I think it's obscenely conservative. But, but what is really important is the fact that, uh, is that this narrative of poverty reduction that's based on the $1.25 uh, per day line is extremely powerful and basically the core justification for the perpetuation of the status quo of the global economy. Okay, Because as long as you can say that poverty is decreasing dramatically and is going to be eradicated by 2030, you know, then, then you can say the global economy is effectively working we just have to keep doing what we're, what we're doing, and eventually everyone's going to benefit, which is fundamentally a lie. It's, and so we, we've been trying to point out that the UN is actively misleading people with these stats. I mean, they come from the World Bank and the FAO um, uh, on hunger. Um, and so, uh, and so the, you know, we've been trying to work on their terms to say, look, the $1.25 day uh, line is completely bogus. We have to ratchet up at least to $5 a day for it to be at all meaningful in an even the most conservative sense. 
because there's no way to convince them to completely abolish the measurement itself. The measurement itself actually has some kind of use to it, I think. Um, uh, but the point is we have to argue hard that it's, it's just it's uh, immorally low. Just briefly about the question of agency, which I think is uh, it's a very good question. Um, I, I think that maybe we are we are we are in a world where there won't be such an obvious candidate for who the hero who's going to save us is going to be, you know, the knight on the white horse. Um, I certainly, I mean, reading of third world politics right now, my sense is that it's very hard to expect it out of any singular grouping of third world countries. There is not a single aspect of international relations, whether it's environment, trade, or any other areas where you see the kind of solidarity that you saw in the 70s, 60s and 70s. There is no real ideology which holds the developing countries together. You know, they had ideology in the past. There is no ideology now. Um, and, but I do think that uh, agency may come, in fact, uh, in a very fractured and fragmented way. Uh, what's agency in the field of trade, for example, may be very different from agency in the field of human rights. Uh, in, the, in the case of trade, for example, if you take the Cancun negotiations, you know, um, in the 2000s, the key issue at that time was over agricultural negotiations. And the countries that are really on the chopping block were actually the small commodity exporters, were mostly African countries. And they actually were faced with the so-called P5, you know, which included countries like India and Brazil, which allied themselves with, of course, the big agricultural super exporters like Canada and Australia and so on. And they were completely left in the lurch, even in terms of negotiation over, over you know, language, but also just reading and responding to the policy drafts and briefs that constitute the core of diplomacy and negotiation in the trade arena. And I would say that agency at the Cancun meeting was really an, a coalition of social movements and friendly states allied with key technocratic NGOs like Oxfam, who were actually doing the background briefing and analysis for these African countries and then they had support from certain key countries in Latin America, right? That, it's totally opportunistic. Now, would that same coalition stick together in every trade negotiation forum? Obviously not. It didn't. But I think we are living in a world like that where the coalition that provides the agency in one setting is, poof, gone next time around. You have to figure out what your next, you know, agency would be. And that's a, that's a work of politics, Right? And I, I do think that, that that's a more useful way of understanding today's world, really. I don't think there is any ideology fixed narratives about heroes and villains in today's world. Uh, uh, just uh, briefly, uh, the question about uh, uh, modern-day slavery. Um, uh, I think that's a very good question because it presents in a very concrete way the major issues where trying to uh, address, however unsuccessfully, about um, how can there be, um, how can we create a situation where countries uh, are such that people are happy to be in their own countries. I mean, um, my own feeling about migrant workers is that they would never leave unless they felt there was something fun, they were driven to actually depart from their countries for whatever reason, <coughs> leaving their families behind and so forth. Um, it also raises, uh, the migration panel I'm sure will address this, but it also raises the issue of uh, what we are perhaps confronting now, which is where that itself becomes something of a weapon, you know, the body as a weapon. <laughs> I don't want to go too much into Fanon here, but, uh, you know, just the movement of peoples, the desperate movement of peoples that we're seeing with Syria and so forth, and that's really engaging Western countries. So that becomes a different type of bargaining, uh, a different type of, uh, you know, um, situation where some kind of remedy has to be formulated. And um, it's literally now affecting the sovereignty and the cultures and everything else of the countries uh, which have all these liberal human rights principles and are now being really tested in terms of how human rights matters in these particular contexts. 
But just a little uh, adding to this, yeah, modern slavery is extremely important, and definitely the the world order should be should be changed that these people could be very happily live in their places. But for, uh, forget about the world order; we can't even change our immigration law or international law about who is refugee, who is not. That they don't accept economic refugees, let alone the climate change refugees. So there's a serious problem on that. The other issue is why now the refugee issue became the, one of the biggest problems in the world because it affects Europe. If it, were, if it was against South uh, Asia, which it has been doing, and in African countries, we didn't even hear about it, who is, which country goes where, what kind of uh, refugee camps and uh, sitting in variety of the African countries, but now because the target is Europe, we all know about it. Thank you. So take some more questions. So I think got, let's take yeah, four questions now in one round. Uh, thanks very much for a great conversation. Um, when we talk about addressing global inequality from a human rights perspective, uh, a lot of people have talked about the, whether rights can do anything, rights as entitlements. But I wonder if you could speak a little bit about what human rights obligations could do in that conversation, in particular, what exists under the National Covenant on Economic, Social, and Culture Rights, the, the duty of international uh, assistance and cooperation, yeah. Yeah. The extraterritorial obligations, and this whole challenge of how we delineate respective duties uh, uh, by country. So, for example, you take uh, illicit financial flows and tax evasion. What specific role does Switzerland have in that? And how can we build on those duties as opposed to uh, uh, developing new rights around them? Or in the trade regime, to what degree does the U.S have a particular responsibility um, for its food subsidies. Um, so maybe you could speak a little bit of, about that, how to differentiate and delineate um, do, human rights duties. Great, to, thank to you. Address global Hello. 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 Thank you. There was one more question at the front there. 
thank you. So I'll hand over to the panel for some closing <laughs> reflections and responses to those questions. Tony, do you want to start? Oh, sorry. Uh, I am now <laughs> fading a bit, so I think I'll <laughs> shut up. <laughs> okay. uh, can, uh, can, I, can I phone a friend? Can I ask Willie to respond? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm, so I'm starting. Yes. You want me to start? I don't know. Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Very, very uh, short. I think we don't have too much time about it. Uh, you ask about the uh, uh, responsibility of the state as a duty bearer. You know, we didn't go that uh, too much there because we didn't have time because according to international human rights principles, the states are responsible, respect, protect, fulfill of the human rights obligations. And this is the, uh, inter, uh, for the civil and political rights and economic and social rights. But the problem is economic and social rights, they think that it's a kind of negative uh, and positive rights that uh, should, the state should really step in and do the things or they don't have to do it. That's, there's a big argument. I'm not going to go uh, this at this stage. But it's a very important uh, dealing with the three important areas of the state that if they really make, if they really respect the right to food, they, they have to make certain kind of uh, policies. Same thing for protect and the fulfill much more importantly, more proactive way. For instance, if you, if the, this doesn't mean that right to food is part of the uh, issue, the issue that states uh, will uh, physically give to food to the citizens, but they have to make a, enough uh, democratic order that they can, the people can have uh, uh, available jobs and the possibility either they can produce or they can uh, they are able to buy the food and I don't want to go detail on these things because they're kind of very simple human rights uh, questions more uh, problematic one is extraterritorial obligations which is states are responsible uh, about the corporate uh, human rights violations that's it's still in international law it's a very gray area how we going to deal with these issues. Uh, I mean, the, the closest is they came, this business and human rights with John Ruggie principles, basically voluntary, and, and there's a limit on that only uh, they, if they have a, a, a certain kind of uh, responsibility in the process, which we call uh, do you, Sorry, due diligence. due diligence. Yes, if they have a due diligence that they, they have to be responsible, but not, then we have we are stepping here. So it's it, it, in the future is it really possible or not? Because there's a home country responsibility and the host country responsibility. For instance, if let's say country A, Sweden uh, corporations go to the Namibia and uh, they sort of destroy the environment and get rid of the people from their lands, uh, Namibia uh, government of Namibia should uh, go act against them. Yes, definitely. But at the same same time, government of Sweden should do the, should have the same responsibility. This is very little bit of controversial, still in international law, but it's an important. Uh, you're, <laughs> that's very good. So if you think that way, you should ask the U U.S. State Department on that. Then they can answer you how to do that. Uh, so, forgive me. Yep. Okay. So apropos of Bernie and agency and and solidarities, I share something of the uh, optimism that a politics of debt, for example, that sort of tied together to the, the bad, the, the unfair debts you know, of students in the U.S. and the unfair debts of um, nations you know, in, in the uh, global south, I don't think that's uh, an impossible kind of resonance and identification on the part of uh, once there's a when and if there's a, another robust redistributive politics afoot in the U.S. Um, and it is centered as it is sure to be if it comes into being around debt um, I think that will both create the sort of a, a greater possible America sort of 
hard hit middle class, working class Americans will not be responsive to massive redistribution to the global south until there is a robust redistributive politics in the United States, if they ever will be. But in those circumstances, a politics of debt that in the ways that Jamie Galbraith was suggesting wove together the ways in which debt is a hinge on which um, both sort of national and international inequality turns will be maybe fruitful. Any other closing this remarks? Very, this is a very brief yeah. uh, reflection on, uh, I think, uh, the Bernie situation uh, here, whether if he gets elected president and does all the redistributive policies that uh, you're all hoping for domestically, whether U.S. as a country can turn that big, you know, ship around and behave in a different way internationally towards other states. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, I think it ties, I mean, to this, the answering this question ties, is tied to um, the legal question of whether there is a duty to cooperate. Uh, will the U.S. recognize its duty to cooperate in a much more effective way if it has been internally transformed through a political revolution led by Bernie Sanders and others. Uh, no one knows, and I don't know the answer either, but the only thing I would say is that uh, I think there is a big difference between, uh, in international relations between the ability of countries to, to negotiate uh, new directions in their external and internal foreign policies uh, depending on their, first, their path dependence, their history of evolution, and secondly, in terms of their, uh, in terms of their power. Uh, power, raw power matters. If you compare, for example, Greece, which also had Syriza, and their ability to repeatedly come up with a budget that would somehow satisfy the creditors, but at the same time also make sure that there is redistributive policy, you know how difficult that has been. And I think there's a big difference between the kind of macroeconomic flexibility afforded to a country like the U.S. compared to that of Greece, where even if there is an internal change, smaller countries, whether it's, you know, Latin countries in Latin America, you know, I'm thinking of countries in other parts of the world, where they may go through internal changes just of the sort that Bernie Sanders is talking about. In fact, they have done that. But they find it extraordinarily difficult to get any sort of returns on their investment, so to speak, domestically. It just doesn't come about. Instead, what you have is the same merciless, unchanging system that actually treats smaller countries and vulnerable people as always targets of exploitation. And I, I, I do think that I, I have, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a big optimist when it comes to the ability of international law to deliver on this. Um, let me just take, take this, something like the draft articles on state responsibility. Let's not even talk about human rights obligations you know, that emerged, the extraterritorial obligation, the duty to cooperate and all that. Just a conventional idea of state responsibility. Now, anyone who has followed the debate about state responsibility and what happened to the ILC's draft articles knows that even taking that one small step, which is totally within conventional international law, is so hard. It's overwhelmed by power. So that's a rather sobering note to end um, what's been a fantastic panel. And I want to flag again that the questions were a great advertisement for so many of the other panels that we'll have over the next two days, raising questions of migration, on which there'll be a panel, austerity and neoliberalism, natural resource governance and health. So it's really just the beginning of what I'm sure will be um, many more really interesting conversations. But please join me in thanking the panellists. And there's a reception outside now. <laughs>